Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Brad, Kevin Morgan, Paul Thiessen, and everybody, welcome two new patrons today, Todd and James. Woo-hoo. Welcome, Todd Woo-hoo. and James. Yay. Welcome. On this episode of DTNS, the U.S. Supreme Court sends social media restrictions back for a retrial, why we all may be overestimating what AI can do, and David Spark tells us how internet video creators are surpassing Hollywood. Driving right by. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 1st. Happy Canada Day 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, the producer and host of the CISO series, David Spark. Welcome back. Great to be here. I've, I've, I think I've been doing shows with you since your inception, yes? Pretty much. Pretty close to it. Yeah, yeah. With all from, the RSA From the first stuff. year on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, thrilled to be back. Well, and thank you for joining us on Canada Day. It is Canada Day. Well, you know, we have a couple of Canadians who work with us. So, Oh, yeah. We have a bunch in the audience. Yeah. Some of some fine people. Some of my f- have, best friends are Canadians. Yes, we have, <laughs> I, uh, we have Canadians that are fans as well. Indeed. All right. Let's start with the quick hits. European Commission has made its preliminary ruling on whether Meta's policy of having you pay in order to not be tracked for personalized ads violates the Digital Markets Act. Surprise, it does. Uh, The DMA (laughs) says that users in Europe must consent to ad tracking and must be given an option to choose an equivalent service without tracking. Now, Meta says, well, yeah, we'll give you an equivalent service. No ads at all. It's just 10 euros a month. Uh, the commission says that the free with ad service has to have an equivalent, not a paid service. It considers the pay service a separate service, particularly because it has no ads at all. Meta says the paid subscription complies with the DMA and will have a chance to make its case in response to the European preliminary finding. However, if Meta is found in violation. The EU could find Meta up to 10% of total worldwide revenue. And this goes to the classic line of, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Indeed. Uh, It's Monday, which lately means we get newsletters from Mark Gurman and Ming-Chi Kuo drumming up interest in Apple leaks. Uh, Not all of them are created equal, but a couple interesting ones this Monday. Gurman says that Apple will alter its Apple Vision Pro in-store demos to include more office features, a little more productivity in the demo, some video watching, including watching some of your own personal videos and photos during the demos, like panoramas, thing that might look good in 360-degree video. Uh, Apple is also planning to bring Apple intelligence to the AVP headset. That's not a huge surprise. Uh, Ming-Chi Kuo says that his supply chain source Sources indicate AirPods will come with infrared sensors by 2026. Uh, the idea would be to use those to support spatial audio and gesture control features, uh, specifically for 360-degree video, things like Apple Vision Pro, so that the sound direction comes along with your, you know, moving your head around and stuff like that. The number of smart glasses that look like glasses but don't do full mixed reality are continuing to grow. This is the category defined by Meta's Ray-Ban smart glasses. Solos has announced its latest pair, the Airgo Vision glasses. They can come with cameras. They do get a mic and ear speakers. So you can ask the glasses to answer questions about things. And if you have the camera option, things that it can see. Uh, it uses Google's Gemini, Anthropic's Claude, and OpenAI's GPT-40 to answer questions questions and it includes an led light that lets you know you know when you got a notification on your phone the base model does not include the camera that one starts at 249 bucks but you can buy swappable frames so you pop just the part with the lenses off that lets you replace that part with the ones that do have a camera and also with ones that will have sunglass lenses instead of clear lenses additional frames start at 89 dollars each i like that they have the buddy holly to the wraparound sort of jackass glasses too, as well. <laughs> whatever you want yeah yeah that, that i think that's why this category is taking off because they look like glasses unlike oh they know. definitely do yeah. yeah and it 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 could actually work 
Samsung becomes the first major smart home manufacturer to fully support Matter 1.2, which will come to Smart Things app later this month or later this summer. Uh, the big addition in 1.2 is support for appliances. So you're talking refrigerators, washing machines, air conditioners, and such. Amazon, Google, and Apple have not yet adopted 1.2. Apple says it will support robot vacuums later this year, but hasn't mentioned any of the rest of that. And finally, there is an active exploit on D-Link DIR859 Wi-Fi routers. Again, just so you can double check your own, we'll have it in the show notes, D-Link DIR859 Wi-Fi routers. Uh, the active exploit might be able to get your passwords uh, if, if there's any uh, route through that router to get them. Uh, the device is past end of life, so there is not a patch coming from this. The solution is unfortunately get a new router, uh, or I guess potentially you could flash new firmware if you're up for that sort of thing. We discovered with older routers, uh, not end of life, but older routers that default have like admin as your password. Oh yeah. Uh, that people were hooking up hard drives and not changing that password and making their pass their hard drives unbelievably visible on the internet. Yeah. So uh, just, you know, check your routers, keep them up to date and change those default passwords, for goodness sake. All right. Uh, we're talking to talk about that U.S. Supreme Court decision that was ruling on two laws, one in Florida, one in Texas. Uh, they both implemented similar laws that would restrict what social media companies could ban or remove from their platforms. Uh, the laws we've talked about before on the show, but generally what they say is that if speech isn't against the law, if it's legal speech, you shouldn't ban or remove it on the platform. Uh, and when you do remove content, you should have transparency around which of your moderation rules it violated. Florida's version of the law requires a thorough rationale for each removal or ban. Uh, Texas requires just a reason to be posted. Uh, it's not quite as uh, constrictive. In Florida, a court found that SB 7072 was unconstitutional. In Texas... A different court found that HB 20 was constitutional, so hence the Supreme Court weighing in. All right. The states were arguing that the law protects the free speech of users, of people who write things on the platform. The social media platforms were saying that the law violates their First Amendment right to exercise editorial control on their platform. The court ruled unanimously, nine to nothing, that both lower courts use the wrong basis to decide the case. Justice Elena Kagan wrote the low, the uh, majority opinion uh, and said that the lower courts must look at a full set of applications and evaluate which are constitutional and which are not, and then weigh whether the unconstitutional applications are substantial compared to the constitutional ones before they decide the validity of the law. Essentially, what they were doing was saying, hey, if Facebook removes this post, is that constitutional or unconstitutional? And the Supreme Court said, you can't just look at Facebook. you got to look at lots of different applications because this law could apply to a lot of different situations, including things like like direct messaging, other platforms, other kinds of social media. Eventually, the lower courts will retry this under this new standard. They will likely get appealed, and this is going to end up back in front of the Supreme Court where they will have to rule on whether it's constitutional or not. Meanwhile, the states are not allowed to enforce these laws. There's an injunction on them while this works its ways through the courts. Uh, David, what do you make of this decision? So I was just thinking as you were saying that, like, do you remember the good old days of letters to the editor? I mean, we still mm -hmm. have that. And in those cases, the editor gets to choose what to publish. What this might be arguing, if we were going back that far, is to say, well, if you don't publish all of our stuff, then you're not allowing us for free speech. Now, back then, we only had a certain amount of space to publish letters to the editor, and so it was understood that only a certain amount could get in. But now with the internet, technically, everything could be published, and we've kind of proven that. But my question is, just because one platform won't publish you, does that mean a violation of free speech? Because it is the internet, you can technically publish anything you want, just as long as it is not harmful to others you know, stays within the rounds of free speech, not yelling, you know, fire in a crowded theater. So uh, I, I'd be interested in knowing, you know, just because one platform won't publish you, then 
go to another platform. How is that any different than someone saying, no, I don't want to publish your article? Yeah. Uh, back in uh, February, we, we kind of talked about the case law behind this, but just to, to sort of bring people up to speed, the, for, the, the argument you're making falls under the precedents like Miami Herald versus Tornillo, where the court said, yeah, you can't be forced to publish a reply uh, to one of your, your newspaper articles. The newspaper gets to decide what goes in there. Uh, Creative versus Ellenus uh, ruled that a website designer could not, under the First Amendment, be forced to make a wedding website uh, for gay couples. Uh, on the state side, though, there are some precedents there as well. Pruneyard versus Robbins found that the shopping center could not prohibit students from collecting signatures for a petition. Even though it's private property, the shopping center was overstepping its bounds and restricting speech. There's also Rumsfeld versus Forum uh, that let Congress tie educational funding to a requirement to allow military recruiters on campus that kind of applies here as well. So, You've got arguments, you've got precedents on both sides. It depends on whether you see the platform as more of a public arena, like a shopping center, or if you see it more like a newspaper. Well, that's, and also there are public forums that people are allowed uh, to speak and publish. If, you, if you're if you a private publisher, you should have a level of control. You know, it, if any of the, the listeners and viewers have, act, have read the new book that came out, uh, called Broken Code by Jeff Harwitz. I highly recommend it because it specifically talks to what Facebook was doing in this respect in terms of what they were publishing and not publishing of user-generated content on Facebook. And essentially the argument that the book makes is Facebook knew about everything. And there was always sort of a decision being made of, do we throttle this down, this this communication, this behavior that could be harmful to others. But if it did, then it would drive less traffic for us, less revenue, less value to our shareholders, or do we let it let it go? And in pretty much the argument the book makes is every time they had a decision to throttle things down to limit what could be harmful content, they chose not to, maybe not every time, but most times. And that was what got sort of Facebook in a lot of hot water, especially mm -hmm. during the election cycle. Yeah, I, th I think um, it's going to be interesting when this ed ends up back in the Supreme Court in a couple of years. It's going to drag out because even though it was a 9-0 ruling, it was it was a vigorous disagreement for that that unanimous ruling. They all ruled that it was judged on the wrong uh, on the wrong criteria and should be sent back. Uh, but there was a, a concurrence that read like a dissent from three of the justices, as well as a couple of others. I think Clarence Thomas was arguing that platforms should be treated like common carriers. And that's why it was improperly judged, because they should consider that. Uh, uh, Justice Thomas loves to bring up common carriers in his dissents, uh, and this time in his concurrence. But they, none of them, most of them didn't really agree on why it should be retried. So once it ends up back in front of them, it'll be interesting to see what they make of it then. Another interesting thing to look out here is that one of the founders of iRobot, uh, you know, the makers of Roomba, is also a professor of robotics at MIT. Rodney Brooks is his name. He also co-founded Rethink Robotics. Uh, he's in charge of a, a current company called Robust.ai that works with AI in robots. He ran the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, CSAIL, from 1997 to 2007. Uh, he is... I don't know if he's famous, but he's kind of well known in certain circles for making predictions about autonomous cars, robots, AI and machine learning, as well as human space travel in 2018. And he promised then I will review my predictions every year until 2050, which so far is he has followed through on, uh, and some of them have been proven wrong and he's been able to go. Yep. I was absolutely wrong about that one. In By the way, kudos, with, kudos to him to, for actually for holding doing himself that to the, the fire. Because a lot of people make predictions and there's never a follow up ever. Yeah. Uh, so he had gave an interview to TechCrunch and he said, We may be overestimating how good generative models are. Uh, the problem is how we as humans generalize. Here's what he said When a human sees an AI system perform a task, they immediately generalize it to things that are similar and make an estimate of the competence of the AI system. Not just the performance on that, but the competence around that. And they're usually very over-optimistic. That's because they use a model of a person's performance on a task. We look at humans and we're like, oh, 
David's good at that. He's probably good at all these other things. And we, we're probably right. We're good at estimating how, how humans generalize from one skill to another. That is not how these models work, though. Uh, he also pointed out that because of Moore's law, we often expect tech capabilities to grow exponentially. Uh, but that doesn't apply to all technology. He used the example of iPods, which I thought was uh, cute. Uh, if they continued to grow exponentially, he points out, we would have had 160 terabyte iPods in 2017. Uh, instead, they maxed out at 256 gigabytes because that's all people needed. Uh, David, are we being too bullish on AI? Um, in in the way that he describes it, of, of uh, attributing human traits or human capabilities, yes, I, I do agree that. Uh, but what I am still bullish about, which isn't in the direction that uh, the scientist says, Rodney, is the just speed of capability. Because I think about where AI was two years ago, one year ago, and today, and I've never seen technology move at this speed before. It's kind of amazing. I mean, I, I, I mean, have you watched just the last two years? Yeah, yeah. What other technology have you seen move at this kind of a clip? No, no, it, I 100% agree with you. But that's what Brooks is saying is, yes, things often take off fast, and then they level out. Not everything yep. is Moore's law and it keeps going fast. So no, what he's saying is don't get fooled by how fast it started. It's still going to level out. Well, I, this is going faster than Moore's law. And also we're seeing new and new, newer capabilities all the time. That's the other thing. It, yeah, just, but it doesn't, it, I, I will say it doesn't matter how, if it's faster than Moore's law, that doesn't mean it won't still follow a bell curve instead of following a, a, a you know, an angle curve, right? It just could get to the top of the bell curve faster. That is possible. But, and, and this is also something we talk a lot about automation in the security industry, in that there's certain things that we see that we can automate very easily today and maybe next year. But then there's other things that that's eh, going to take a long, long time to literally replace a human or replace certain very sort of cognitive yeah, yeah. human tasks. Yeah. And I, I I think that's what Brooks is trying to counter is like, look, he's not. And he says this to TechCrunch. He's like, I'm not saying these are not capable models. And he's not trying to say they won't improve. He's just saying we tend to overgeneralize. Right. Uh, and I like his his analogy yeah. to, uh, to how we see humans, because because these these AI machines are completing human tasks quite well. Yeah. Then and literally completing natural. our sentences for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it seems natural that people would do that and attribute human behavior, especially like if you go into one of these chats with them and they talk yep. like another human, inevitably we're going to feel like that. Yeah, it's 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 difficult to learn, uh, un to unlearn the signal that confident, well-spoken English, uh, in our case, uh, means competence. It, mm -hmm. it, this it, this is a classic example of of a of a, uh, of a very good salesperson. Uh, <laughs> large language models are very good at sounding confident when they tell you something that is utterly wrong, although often they're utterly right. Uh, so we we kind of look at that confidence and we look at how well they do some things, and then we make we sometimes make the mistake of of jumping to the conclusion that well they must be able to do everything and. And that was one of the things Brooks was saying is like, look, when I'm developing warehouse robots, which is what he's doing in his current company, he's like, I don't need it to have a large language model. I've had so many people tell me I need a large language model. He's like, we have a warehouse. There's nothing on the floor. It's very defined. We need 10,000 orders processed in the next two hours. A large language model would be way too much and it would not be accurate to what we need. We, what it we would, need it is a more noise. specifically trained model. Exactly. It would introduce noise. Perfect. It, it would Perfect introduce size. and it would screw it up. Yeah. That's what it would do. Uh, well, if you have a thought about this or anything else we talk about on the show, uh, we love to get your feedback and we, we read every single email we get. Uh, if we get really insightful stuff from, from those of you in the audience who have expertise, we, we like to share that with the rest of the audience as well. Uh, so please do email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. 
VidCon is still going on. Uh, it's an annual oh. convention for online video that just wrapped up its 2024 convention this past weekend. When I say it's still going on, I mean like you know they they still it have still it. Still exists. Every, yeah, the it's not going on right now. A couple days ago. <laughs> I just mean like you may have remembered VidCon. Guess what? That still happens. Uh, yeah. It brings together creators, fans, and corporate sponsors, uh, and all that kind of thing. David was there for the entire run. Uh, so explain to folks what VidCon is. Yeah, so VidCon's a really kind of fascinating event in that it's primarily for creators and their fans. So at one level, um, VidCon invites some of the biggest creators to come out. And when I say creators, I'm talking about online video creators. So people who are on TikTok and on YouTube and on Instagram primarily. And um, they invite them out. And then other creators are also welcome to come as well. Um, and then their fans, because these big creators come out, they let their fans know that they'll be there. So their fans attend as well. And they're just, it's a very sort of exciting moment for the creators to meet their fans and their fans to have one-on-one -on -one time with the creators as well. Um, I, I do want to mention that my son, who's a big fan of these YouTube personalities, he walked up, he just was, you know, walking around the floor, recognized tons of these people and he got autographs of these creators. And here's, if you can see, look at this. These are all the autographs of all the creators that he met. And again, he's a 10 year old kid that just walked up and that's how friendly everyone was. We were happy to sign this sheet for him. Um, now at the other two levels of this event, there is uh, the opportunity for creators to learn more about how to um, create video and how to grow their audience. And then for the brands and the marketing agencies out there that are looking to engage and communicate with this audience, like how do they work with creators to partner with them to be able to, to sort of sell their wares or market their wares through this creator audience. So it, it's sort of a show for the whole ecosystem, if you will. Yeah, and I, I think uh, I I went to to VidCon ten years ago. Uh, you know, it's been kicking oh, it was around barely for a while. anything back yeah. then. What what was interesting is now. that same that same feeling where there were like a crowd of fans uh, chasing a YouTuber through the lobby <laughs> of the <laughs> hotel because they were excited and it was all in good fun. It wasn't like a dangerous situation, but you know, uh, that was happening then and. It is how many times bigger than it was back then uh, with, with these creators even bigger. Uh, yeah. This, I joked that they were Hollywood level stars then. They're, they're bigger oh. than Hollywood stars now. Yeah, I love that you mentioned that. Here's what I say about this show to my friends. And I am not the target audience for this show. But I always say, if you want to feel completely out of touch with teenagers today, go to VidCon. Because <laughs> that, they are having their sort of their own experience with their own audience. Um, it's really impressive. And, and I do want to mention one, one quick story about connecting community communities. You didn't even know there. there's uh, a very successful YouTuber by the name of Holly Burke. And she um, has a YouTube channel for about herself being blind for people to learn more about people who are blind or engaging w different things that blind people like to do in our environment and the story she told that i thought was quite touching is that she became blind at age 14. uh she had a degenerative disease that that caused this and what happened is she lost her friends at age 14 mm. and she started to listen slash watch youtube videos that were dealing with the same issues that she had and these people on YouTube became her friends. And then she started to create stuff for the same kind of issues she was dealing with. And one example she gave was, how do blind people put on makeup? And, you know, because there are issues, obviously, there. And she made video about just that. So what I was really kind of impressed by, and, you know, our, the audience knows it, is that all the niches are there. It's a way that they can connect, and it's kind of cyclical in the sense that you first become a fan, and then you become a creator, and then you create your own fans as well. Yeah, and I, I've been talking for for a while now about how really entertainment and politics and, and a lot of other areas are now focused on fandoms. Fandoms drive things. 
Uh, and and one example of that is wanting physical items to go with your digital stuff. And you heard a little bit about that, it yeah. sounds like, too. Yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, I want to correct. I, I think I said Holly Burke. It's Molly Burke ah, gotcha. uh, is, is the Good. woman's name. Um, yeah, so they were talking about making money from this. And the thing is that they're often selling digital goods. So either my video, because there's the idea of you can get my video for free, but then there's like a pay version, especially in education as well. And while you want them to subscribe to your service or your payment service, your education service, it was very difficult to get them to just pay large dollar amounts, like be sometimes 700, 800, a thousand dollars for your education program. If there wasn't a physical thing attached to it. And so they started to, to sell material goods in addition to the digital goods, and that allowed them to close their sales. They found that just doing digital loan wasn't enough to get people to click and buy. And I think they needed the tangible. And that physical good could be a book, it could be a t-shirt, it could be a hat, it could be anything. Yeah. Uh, and, and just... When when you have those, you know, thousand true fans or whatever, uh, just giving them something to feel like they're closer to what it is they're a fan yeah. of, whether that's a hat, a book or anything else. Uh, right. Is it still a thousand true fans? Is, is that still well, the, the meme? So that's a Kevin Kelly meme. And it still holds true. But there are different kinds of creators. They're the entertainment creators. They're the, the the thought leader creators. And there's also the education creators. And one education creator believes that it's really a thousand true students. And his argument is because uh -huh. you can charge more for education and often you can actually make more revenue that way. It's like, you know, you think about how much money you spend on your favorite entertainer is, and if you are learning through online, you're probably going to be spending a lot more on education than you do on fandom. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. And it, it, they're kind of intertwined in, in those situations as well. Mm -hmm. uh, la last thing I want to ask you about is, is the AI of it all. We were just talking about, you know, whether, whether AI is as good as people say it is, yeah. but everywhere you go, everyone's talking about whether or not it fits in with what they do. What were they saying about it at VidCon? So plenty of sessions about AI at VidCon. Uh, and there was one uh, that was hosted by Jim Lauterbach, who we both work with over at Tech TV. And he led what he called the good, the bad, and the ugly of AI. And what I really liked, and he got the audience very much involved in it, and it was a panel discussion. He went through all the different aspects of AI and how we're all using AI. So we're using it through generating content, you know, images, music, um, helping us with, you know, legal stuff, a lot of different aspects of AI. And... He asked, how far along are we in the success of this? And so he got the audience, you know, applaud. I like it's good. It, eh, I don't think it's really there or it's ugly. This is horrible. And it was a different response on every topic. And that's what was interesting is that certain parts of AI have advanced that people are accepting and uncomfortable with. And other parts, it's advancing in a way that we don't like at all. But what I found intriguing is I think he should do this same discussion next year because I think the answers will be completely different. Yeah, let me, I, I'm guessing uh, a, AI that replicates what a creator does, they don't like. AI that makes it easier to do what a creator does, they did. Exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, like you say, well, uh, you're, it, you're from now. There's going to be different answers. Well, what's funny, like like the AI and the music came up, and it was and people were like applauding, yeah, it's good. And then there was a huge group that said, boo. And yeah. It was, like, it was obvious. Those were all the musicians. Those are the musicians, right? Yeah. Everybody who needs <laughs> like a, a cheap sound bed uh, for their video loves it, you know, and the yeah. musicians don't. All right. Before we get out of here, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, we, we do uh, top fives on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash daily tech news show. And last Friday, speaking of uh, holding yourself to account on predictions, my top five that, that Roger put together was my f top five all time wrong predictions. The things I predicted that I was the, the most wrong about. Uh, you can check that out at our YouTube channel. Howard responded, my goodness. I was definitely in the camp of email is so full featured compared to instant messaging. Why don't people just use email? Uh, which was one of my predictions, like instant messaging won't succeed. Uh, you can instantly message people already with email. Um, and I was sorely, sorely wrong, David. I was sorely wrong. I actually just saw a taping of it, of the show, The Masked Singer. And I remember when I first saw it on TV, I said, this isn't going to last three episodes. 
12 seasons later boy was <laughs> i wrong <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, there, there's a lot a lot more where that came from but uh, trust me uh go check it out youtube.com slash daily tech news show and thank you david spark uh for hanging thank out with you, us and Tom. reporting from vidcon it's always great to get your rsa reports uh which i hope we'll I get later that. this summer as You'll, well uh well, no, but no, great no, to get the vidcon is, one too black hat is going to be later this summer rsa will have to do it again next year Oh, right. Black Hat is next. That's right. I was confusing That's the coming two. coming up Thank in you. August, yeah. so I will yeah, be Black here Hat. for Black Hat. Fantastic. Uh, where can folks follow you until then? Well, you can go to see if you, especially if you're into cybersecurity, please go to CISOseries.com. We have tons of programming. We have five shows on our network. We're dropping tons of great stuff every week. And uh, I, you know what, by the way, Tom, I got to give you kudos. One of our shows, um, Cybersecurity Headlines, which is our most successful show, we built it on your model, and I got your blessing to do it. Excellent. Uh, so if you like his headline show, but you wish it was more cyber-related, right. listen to Cybersecurity Headlines. Definitely. Go check it out, folks. And if you're a patron, stick around for the extended show. David and I are going to talk a little more about using things like large language models in our own work. How do we yeah. use it? What do we find works? Uh, what do we find does not? What What's hype and what's not? Stick around for that. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with more. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>